Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often, and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees? But thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast, while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them, no man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the pieces that taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles, and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be into new bottles, and both are preserved." No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this passage, Lord. I just pray that you'll just help us to understand these, uh, these parables, these, uh, these statements of the Lord Jesus Christ about the old and also the new. Lord, I just pray that you'll help us understand and realize the importance of both, uh, the importance of uh, treating them uh, equally as they, as they are needed in their place. Lord, as patients help us to understand uh, these parables. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so in these passages, we've been looking at the testimony of Luke uh, towards Theophilus. Uh, again, ministering uh, on behalf of, most likely on behalf of Paul the Apostle. Uh, when he's in Rome, um, looking to be j tried before the Roman courts, and here he, Luke is, is giving and presenting to Theophilus uh, the overall account of the ministry of Jesus Christ, the overall account of why Paul is doing what he is doing, and where Paul came from, and so forth. And here in this passage, he's talking about the ministry of Christ. He's also talking about especially those first followers that started following after the Lord. In the previous passages, we saw where uh, Peter um, saw the miracles of the Lord with his, with his mother-in-law and with the catch of the fishes and, and with his messages and his preaching and, and the loaning of his boat and, and various different things. Peter and then those that were with him, James and John, uh, they also uh, started following Lord Jesus Christ. Those first few followers, those three followers there. And then also here uh, we see in, in this passage about Levi following him, uh, a fourth follower and so forth. And so we see where the Lord is ministering among people. He's doing his great commission from the time of his baptism, uh, where the Lord ordains him into this ministry, uh, to his public ministry uh, for the Lord. And he is doing those things that the Lord has called him to do from his baptism and that he would indeed came into the world to do. Uh, and so in this passage, uh, we, we've seen, of course, in in the previous messages about how that he's healing people physically and spiritually, how that he's, feel, he, he's healing those people based upon their faith towards God and based upon their faith uh, towards the spiritual matters. And then in the spiritual matters, they believe and have faith, and therefore they have the desire to be also healed physically. Uh, you cannot be healed physically here until you are focused on the spiritual. See, they didn't come to the Lord necessarily for the physical first, but rather for the spiritual. And then the Lord, is, especially in the last passage we saw, where the Lord did things physically to show them what was happening in the spiritual realm. Just as he forgave this man in the pe previous passage of his sins, his sins, for, or at least he was forgiven, so too he was, uh, he was healed Physically, and we talked about all that, of course, in that passage. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Uh, and so we see, we see in this passage, Levi now is uh, being called to follow the Lord. Levi is being called to follow the Lord. Uh, he says, 
He says, after these things, he went forth. After what things? The things of the, the man being healed from the couch, the man, uh, you know, those things that are being spoken of the Lord, and those things that had happened at the seaside. Uh, he is seeing all these things. Uh, Levi is, is living in these areas. He's seeing what the Lord is doing in those things. Of course, you know, fishermen, especially in this passage, it talks about how that he's sitting at the receipt of custom. He's sitting at the receipt of custom. And so, of course, the publican here are the tax collectors. You know, how often times do we often joke that uh, uh, publicans are just, you know, Republicans are just uh, publicans done over again. You know, they are uh, politicians always like to collect taxes. That's um, just depends on one side likes to collect taxes more than the other side. But they all like to collect taxes. Uh, and. It's just the, the question between the both parties is not whether you're going to fly off a cliff eventually, but whether you want to fly off that cliff slowly or fast. And so that's the difference between uh, those politicians. But here uh, it says the publican, not necessarily the Republican, but the publican, uh, the tax collector. Basically, uh, he collected taxes and he also collected those things on behalf of the Roman Empire. Uh, so in this section, what a publican did oftentimes, they would get a commission, uh, a, a region of area, to collect taxes for the Roman government, and they would bid these things out. So like if you were a contractor working for the government, you would, uh, the lowest bidder would uh, get, um, would get the, the, the contract. So here, Levi has a contract with the Roman government, and he is a publican. He is in charge of collecting taxes, and anything he collects over that, he gets paid for. So say, for example, the expectation is for Rome to get $10 per person. Uh, Levi would be allowed to charge $15 Per person, so that he would cover his costs and make some for himself, and then so instead of your taxes being ten dollars to the Roman government, it was fifteen dollars to the to Levi, uh, who would take his commission off of that. And so it was very valuable, lucrative to make money being uh, getting one of these things. As long as you were guaranteed to get Rome their cut, you did, they didn't really care how much you scammed the people, as long as they got their amount. So they would be, these estimators would say, hey, uh, Levi, your region is expected to have so many people on the tax rolls, and so we need um, $10 million from you for this region. And then so Levi would collect maybe $20 million, and he would give $10 million to them, he would keep 10 for himself, or something like similar to that. Uh, and it, would, uh, it didn't really matter to some of these publicans what the people could afford, but they would just kind of try to make the amount of money they wanted to without kind of killing the golden goose, if you will. So how, however much money they could get from the people uh, while keeping the peace, that's what they would do. And also, not only that, just like any tax collectors, they could force the people to pay them the taxes that they were owed. Uh, and so uh, nobody really liked uh, the tax collectors, the publicans. Uh, and basically, is, is their own people forcing them to pay tribute to Rome. Uh, it, it's similar to where if you would say, if you would have somebody come into your town and say, I'm collecting taxes for China. You know, we would be like, no way are you going to, I'm going to pay you taxes for China. But then a soldier would come in and say, hey, no, you had to pay those taxes. And then they'd be forced to uh, pay them. Uh, that's the way they kind of felt, the Jewish people felt when Rome was collecting their taxes. But then they had no choice because they were subjugated to Rome underneath the uh, threat of law. Uh, and so we see here in this passage that uh, he's calling, uh, he got an interesting group of people that he's calling. He's calling fishermen uh, that are unlearned and ignorant men that have been with Jesus. Uh, he's calling them. Uh, and then he's also calling uh, publicans, people that are publicly despised. And so often times that people, uh, you think about the people that Jesus is calling here, it's this everyday people living life that he's calling to serve him and to follow him. So oftentimes people think, well, you need to be to Bible college 35 years or whatever and get your PhD and two PhDs and a, and, and a thesis and all these things, and you need to know three, three dead languages uh, in order to be able to handle the word of God. But here it is Peter and Paul and, and uh, James and John and Levi and Matthew. They are all following Jesus, and they are not, this, other than maybe Paul the Apostle, is not, um, do not have law degrees and things, and they're not very fancy in education, if you will. They are basic run-of-the-mill people. 
it kind of tells me the, the type of people that the Lord is calling around him is that oftentimes people get too learned for their own good that they do nothing with it. But anyway, uh, here in this passage it says, uh, And saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. Follow me. So here it is that uh, Levi has a wonderful job, an awesome job, uh, that uh, it's probably the most lucrative jobs that uh, people can get in his day. And he gave it all up to follow Jesus, to follow the Lord. Uh, just as in the previous passage, it says that, uh, that the fishermen gave up their fishing to catch men. Verse 10 of this chapter says, And so was James and John, the son of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Levi was more interested in uh, getting spiritual gains than physical gains. And so here we see in this passage that Levi saw what the Lord was doing, and he didn't let people, uh, let his job, his company, or anybody to despise him in that. It says, and he left all, rose up, and followed him. Not only that, he didn't just follow Jesus. He, he told everybody else in his profession about what he was doing. Uh, here it says, and Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. With them. And so here, here's something interesting to note, is that, is that he left all, he rose up and he followed him, and Levi made a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. So not only did he say, oh, I'm converting to Christ, he made it publicly known. He made it publicly known, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. I am serving the Lord. I am going into ministry. Uh, and so it's important to realize that, that when we get saved, when Christ saves us, is that we ought not to keep it quiet. Oh, yeah, Christ saved me, but I'm not going to tell anybody about it. I'm just going to go about my daily life. Something changed in the life of Levi. His work life changed. His uh, career changed. He said, follow me. And not only that, he said, a feast in his own house. I think this is interesting that uh, Peter starts out and uh, in verse 38 of chapter 4, and he rose out of the synagogue and desired to go to Simon's house. And Simon's wife and mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And so now he's ministering in Simon's house. And then in chapter 5, uh, he ministers in Simon's boat. He ministers in Simon's boat. So he's doing spiritual matters, but he's using the physical things of the people. He's using the physical things of the people. And so Levi most likely is following the, after this same thing. Here is Peter. He's following the Lord. He's giving up everything for the Lord, and he's letting the Lord use his physical material wealth. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. So notice this, that he, they welcomed the Lord into their house. And so not only did they give up their job and their livelihood and change their lives for the Lord, they welcomed him into his house. We also need to welcome the Lord into our houses. Uh, how are we uh, with welcoming the Lord into our house and to those that we are with? How oftentimes are we willing to let people know uh, the Lord? And here it says, made a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down. When you think about a feast, the, the cost that goes into it, you get a roast, you get a lamb, uh, cost money for those things. You, you, uh, every Thanksgiving we always hear about how that, hey, the cost of a Thanksgiving dinner for a family of four uh, rose up this year. And they talked about it, it's $150, $250 or whatever for a family of four or whatever. But this is a great feast. So it costs not only him his job, but a lot of his savings to throw this great feast. But why? He felt it was important to, to spend physical money and to, to make a great feast so that he could tell them about Jesus and to minister to them over a dinner. And so he's using his resources uh, to make a great feast to invite his friends and family uh, to know the Lord. He put his money where his mouth is, if you will. And he put his uh, food where his, uh, where his Savior was, too. Uh, but, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against the, his disciples. Oh, how oftentimes do we have people that you're trying the best you can with what you have to serve the Lord, and the people complain, well, you're not doing it right, well, you're not the right type of person, you're, you're, you're not worthy of serving the Lord. Here's a publican, uh, spending his money, 
Why would the Lord let him be used of, of God? You know, how oftentimes we look at our own lives and say, I'm not worthy to serve the Lord. How oftentimes do people look at other people and say, that person is not worthy to serve the Lord. Now, there is a lot of times when, when people, uh, when they get saved, they tell others. They, you know, a homeless person, when they get saved, they oftentimes will tell others. You know, there's one say, saying that, uh, that giving the gospel out is similar to a beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Uh, and so it's the same way with our lives. People will get critical of us serving the Lord. Here's people that are supposed to be spiritual. They're supposed to be uh, the, the doctors. They're supposed to be the, the separated ones, the people that are serving God. And yet when people really, truly start serving God, they're the first ones to criticize. They're the first ones to say, you're not serving God the right way. You're not serving God. You've got to clean up your life and stop being a publican. You know, you stop serving other publicans. Uh, you need to stop serving Rome. You need to stop being a Democrat. You need to stop being a Republican. You need to stop being a conservative. You need to stop being a liberal. All these random things that people want them to clean up their life before you can serve God. Well, you're not separated unto the Lord good enough. You need to be a Pharisee first. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there were great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. And so here he is inviting people that he knows, but then it wasn't good enough for the separated ones, the, the Pharisees, murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? It's similar to the fact that when uh, a lot of churches, when they first started bus ministries, if you will, uh, it, it's a similar comparison is where, where the... Uh, the well-to-do church and the well-to-do people bringing their families in nice little rows. Uh, and then when the bus ministry starts, all these little kids uh, start coming in uh, and all these parents with no vehicles and, and uh, lower in part of town and they don't have the nicer clothes and their kids uh, bring juice boxes or whatever and they just start uh, damaging the carpet or they don't, wipe, they don't clean up well for church and they are just dirty, grungy people just because of their upbringing, that uh, the well-to-do and uppity-ups in the church will say, well, they're ruining our carpets. Well, they're not treating things properly. Well, why is that bad person in our area? We don't want them near our family. So oftentimes people look on the outside and then they look at people's uh, religion, they look at people's um, political status, they look at people's uh, social status. They look at all these different things and they become critical. Why did that person bring that person to church? Don't they know what type of lifestyle they live? Now, yes, it is difficult to minister into places uh, that are not like you. Uh, and also, obviously, clearly worse than you, if you will. Here are these Pharisees following the law. They're separated unto the Lord, uh, outwardly at least, but yet their heart has not been separated from sin. Their heart is still in denial. He says, but their scribes and their Pharisees murmured against his disciples. So scribes would be those that write, can write. They, they write the word of God and, and they, they are able to, they're close to, close to the scriptures. Pharisees are those who, who take what the scriptures say and they, they, uh, they try to live them out in their lives which is, those things are not bad. And we see, of course, later on in, in Paul's ministry that a lot of the scribes and the Pharisees also get saved and converted to Christ, which is wonderful. Uh, but they allowed their heart to murmur against his disciples. Notice this, it says against his disciples. Against Jesus' disciples. Oftentimes that when people are actually physically ministering for the Lord, bringing people into his house, that the separated ones that outwardly are supposed to be the spiritual ones. Outwardly, they're supposed to be the guides. They're supposed to be those that help. Their heart is not in that part. They're so separated that they're, the, what the, the phrase oftentimes is they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Now, they should have allowed their understanding of scriptures to empower them to do the work of ministry, but they didn't. But the people who were working in the ministry that weren't the educated, weren't the highly skilled, weren't the so knowledgeable on every little dot and tittle of the, the scriptures, they were doing the ministry of Christ and they were murmuring against the actual workers of ministry. You know, it's similar to when somebody is, uh, is 
knows how to read a, uh, a car manual versus the truck driver who actually drives the truck and brings the goods to market. It's often times that we have people that they know how uh, the, every word of the car manual, the truck manual, but they don't ever use it to drive things to market. They're always complaining about how this part will break down if you move it that way, and this part, and, and if you get the seat cover dirty, then it's hard to clean, and, and they're always complaining and murmuring about how that this type of truck is not good uh, to be moved or used for work. But yet the person using that same truck is bringing people to work to things to market, and yet that person is murmuring and complaining, the mechanic is murmuring and complaining that he has to change the oil. Uh, you know, it, it's similar to that sort of attitude. But there's, he says, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Why do you work in the filth? Why do you go to places that are not separated unto God? Why do you go to the ghettos? Why do you go uh, to the Democrats? Why do you go to the liberals? Why do you go to those places? Don't you know there was a riot there last year? Those people are the same people that rioted last year. Uh, no. You have to minister where God calls you. You have to minister where Jesus is. You have to go where Jesus goes. That is part of being the disciple. See, Jesus desired to go to Levi's house. Jesus went to Peter's house. Jesus was going there. Therefore, the disciples need to go where Jesus is going. And we as Christians need to, yes, we should be separated unto the Lord. Yes, we should know the scriptures. Those are important things. But where is Jesus going? Is he going to the great colleges to, to learn Greek and Hebrew? Or is he going into the houses of the people that need him? And Jesus answered and said unto him, They that are whole need not a physician. They that are whole need not a physician. Here the scribes and the Pharisees want to hang out at the doctor's office with no sick patients. Here they want to take care of healthy people. Uh, but their scribe, it says, but they that are sick. Remember his calling? Remember what God called him to? He says, he says in the previous passage here that he is here to heal the brokenhearted. Verse 18 of chapter 4 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to who? The poor. Not the educated, not the scribes. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Those who know their condition. The scribes and the Pharisees weren't brokenhearted. They didn't care what the Lord was there for. They wanted to have their own life. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty to them that are bruised. See, the Pharisees were blind in the sense that they were not focusing on the Lord. They were focusing on the outward things of the people that were getting converted. Eventually, those people, yes, those, eventually those people will learn the scriptures. Eventually, those people will get cleaned up. Eventually, those people will be separated into the Lord. But you cannot put separation before uh, sanctification. and You cannot put sanctification before salvation. Uh, so those things need to be uh, set in the right order. First, they are saved and converted as they were being converted here, and then they can be sanctified and separated. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John? So he says, he says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So you need to get humble, you need to get poor in spirit before you can get uh, saved. He said unto them, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. So now they're complaining about the method of ministry. So here at first it was the who are they ministering to? So oftentimes when people complain about ministry, actually physically doing ministry, they complain about those who are being ministered to. Oh, you're ministering to the sick, you're ministering to the disabled, you're ministering to the despised of this world, you're, you're ministering to the, those people. And then the other way is the method of ministry. Oh, well, you know, true ministry is supposed to be uh, sanctimonious and, and uh, harmonious, and, and it has to be uh, high and spiritual and, and uh, you know, all this formal uh, religion. Uh, and here he says, he said unto them, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? You know, how oftentimes you go to a church where they're, where they're so formal and they're so rigid that there's no actual ministry going on, but it's all formalistic and ritualistic. 
He says, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. Here they are eating and drinking. They're going to people's houses. They are living life, and they're ministering living life. So oftentimes people don't want to minister uh, through life. They want to minister in a separated, ritualistic, formalistic thing where, where it's not really about the people that are being healed. It's about them uh, making a show, making a presentation. How to times does the guy on stage need to have the, the uh, very expensive Gucci whatever jeans and, and they're all ripped and shredded stylishly in the modern day and they have to have all these fancy things, whether it's ritualistic in the sense of a, of a modern uh, liberal way or a modern conservative way where they have the staves and the hats and the, and the backwards collars. They have all these crazy things that they want to minister in a way that is all formal and ritualistic. He said unto them, can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? So here they are focusing on the way of ministry. He says, hey, the way of ministry is different depending on the situation depending on the situation. Here, Jesus is with them. Jesus is with them. So you're celebrating being with Jesus. You're celebrating the birth. When, when we see in the story of the, uh, of the, uh, of the um, prodigal son, what happens when the prodigal son returns? There's a big feast. There's a celebration. Uh, what happens with the, with the separated son who is separated unto the Lord? He's upset. There's, there's a big feast and there's a big celebration. When people come to the Lord, we should not be murmuring, we should be celebrating. We should be celebrating. Here, somebody had not the Lord, and, and they were not with the Lord, and there was uh, sadness, there was strictness, there was formality. And then now, when the Lord comes, there's a feast, and there's a celebration, there's an excitement, uh, and there's an importance of that event. Uh, we should never neglect uh, the, uh, the fact when Christ comes into somebody's life that it's a celebration and not time for murmuring and not time for complaining. And so here we see, of course, uh, he says, But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. There is a time and place for rituals. There is a time and a place uh, for doing uh, the formula, if you will. There is a time and place for having the pras fasting and prayers. Uh, Jesus never says that fasting and prayers is wrong. In fact, there are other times when he's not feasting. We see him in the previous passage, uh, in verse 16, it says, And he withdrew himself into the wilderness, and what did he do? He prayed. We see in the previous passage, uh, in, in, uh, right after his uh, baptism, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led into the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And those days did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. So he's fasting and praying in his life. So it's not that those things are wrong, but rather at the celebration of the coming of Christ into their lives, there's a great feast, there's a great celebration. At the return of the prodigal son to the father, there's a great feast, there's a great celebration. And so here, they're like, oh, we should never celebrate, we should never deviate from the formula, if you will, the rituals and such. So oftentimes, people want to say, hey, you have to be rigid in all those things. You can't, uh, you can't save people in the wrong, I I I using those methods. You, you have to do it the way we demand it. But no, he says, no, when Jesus Christ comes into life, there's a celebration, there's an opportunity of excitement, and they, because there's a newness there. He spake also this parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new and the, maketh, and the new maketh the rent, and the piece that taketh out the old agreeeth not with the old. Taketh out the new agreeeth not with the old. So here's this parable. He says, hey, uh, what you're doing is similar to what, uh, is to what somebody does when they take an old garment. Nothing wrong with the garment. It needs mending, it needs fixing, and there's a little thing that needs to be taken care of. But what you're doing is you're taking a brand new garment, you're ripping that garment up, and you're putting it on the old person. Hey, you know, uh, this section of the garment, the garment of salvation, the garment that God has given to us when we have new life in Christ, uh, we need to just rip the sanctification out and, and plaster it onto the old garment of, of sin and disgrace and the rags of, uh, of life. And, and no, they're two different garments. They're two different garments. 
you, are, you need to realize that the new will not agree with the old. The new will not agree with the old. What does the Bible say about the Old Testament? It's a law master to bring us to Christ. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's nothing wrong with rituals. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with sanctification. There's nothing wrong with separation. But you cannot rip parts of the new and slap it onto the old. Because that will not help the old garment. It will not help the new garment. You've rent, rent two garments. Uh, and you are ruining two garments. You're trying to make help to times to people, especially uh, today, uh, they want to take the Christian life over here. And they want to conform it to the life of living under the law. The, the life of law underneath Christ with the law underneath the Old Testament. And so how oftentimes do people want to take parts of the New Testament, the New Testament living, New Testament Christian, and they want to try to slap it on the Old Testament garment. They oftentimes want to take Old Testament things and make them New Testament things, or they want to take New Testament things and make them Old Testament things. Now there's no, nothing wrong with an old te the Old Testament. It's a wonderful testament. But we have a New Testament. How to ties the Catholics want to uh, take the Christian New Testament, strip it all apart, and then slap it on uh, the priesthood of the Old Testament. And say, hey, look, this is the New Testament now. No, they're rending it. They're making it different. How often times do people want to go back to the Hebrew roots and make a Christian life the same as a Hebrew life? Uh, it is not the same. Uh, they want to make a Gentile life the same as a Jew's life. It's not the same. It's not the same garment. He says, and he says, no man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. So you need to see what you're doing, Pharisees. You need to be careful what you're doing. The, the celebration, the fact that they are saved now, that God is with them, will show that they receive the new garment. But don't try to make their old garment uh, look like the new. It's just going to ruin it. It's going to rend it. You cannot take the two. If we look quickly at, uh, at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse sixteen, it says, Nevertheless, when it shall of course I probably got the wrong passage. All right, well, I got the wrong passage here. All right, let's go ahead and go to probably 1 Corinthians. Let's check that. Nope, probably not. So let's go on to another one. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. It says, And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now the problem with the Pharisees they had was that they were trying to make Jesus' New Testament conform to the Old Testament when they were two different Testaments. Uh, when, you have a when you don't have a sacrifice for sin yet, you have to do things in a certain way. Uh, but when you have a New Testament, you, you have to do things in the New Testament way. So oftentimes people want to mix and match the two. And then also Matthew chapter 13, verse 52.
He says, Then he said unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasures things new and old. So the, the old is good in its place, and the new is good in its place, but you, it's new and old. You don't take the new and slap it onto the old. You don't take the old and slap it onto the new. It does, it's not good. You have to have, uh, they have to be the same. They have to be the same. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be, a, be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. So here in this passage, they're trying to make uh, them conform to the old, Hey, here's these, here's these publicans and these sinners. They need to reform their lives. They need to get better. They need to stop being Democrats. They need to be stop being liberals. They need to be stop, stop being sinners. They need to be stop all this stuff. No, the, that's underneath the Old Testament. That's underneath the law. That's underneath condemnation. The law being a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now we are in the new garment, the new life, the, the new bottles, the new wine, if you will, is over here. He says, so what you're doing is when you see these people getting saved and getting to the new, they have a new life, you're murmuring about the aspects of their old garment. You're murmuring about the aspects of their old life that you see on the shell, the outward part, the, the, the part that will pass away. And it has become old. And you're trying to reform the old habits and the old life. You, you can't do that before you get them saved. And so here, the new garment's good, the old garment is old, but it has to have, you have to take care of the old garment in the old way, you have to take care of the new garment in the new way, you cannot smash them together, otherwise they do not agree with the old. It says, and, and so, both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. So you need to, when, especially when we are, as Christians, we need to realize that, hey, a new thing is happening in these people. Yes, they were the lowest caste, they were outcasts in society, they were not conformed in the way of the youth, but they're, now they're new. They're in the new thing. You should not look at them as Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative. You should look at them as your Christian brothers in Christ. They have a new thing and then we rejoice with them. They are now in the New Testament. And, and that's what he's saying here. You need, to focus, you need to stop worrying about what they look like on the outside and what they recently were that needs conformity and reform. Oh, look at that. They, they need to get rid of it. No, you've got to celebrate with them in this new life that they're having. And that was the problem with the scribes and the Pharisees. They didn't want to celebrate the new life. They didn't want to celebrate them being with Christ. And no man puts the new wine in old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. So there was nothing wrong with the new wine or the old bottles, uh, but it, combining them together was the issue, the problem. Uh, you have to have old wine in old bottles, and you have to have new wine in new bottles because they have to grow together. The vessel has to grow together with the spirit in them. Else the new wine will burst, and the bottles be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. How to times do people also want to take uh, the modern way? You know, you got an old-fashioned church. Nothing wrong with an old-fashioned church living in an old-fashioned way, doing old-fashioned things. That's fine. But then you want to have a church that is, you want to have a new generation come in that's doing everything hip and hop and, and, and modern way, if you will, and they're trying to mesh them together. Now, they can serve the Lord the way they want to serve the Lord, and we can serve the Lord the way we want to serve the Lord, but when you try to take an old style, an old fashion, and you try to make it a modern and hip, and it's like, for example, if we had an old building here, and I stood up here and ripped jeans and stuff, that would look out of place, right? You know, and sometimes people want to go to a rock and roll concert and wear a conservative suit and tie, and then that looks out of place. You know, you can't mix and mash the, the two together. You have to have uh, the, it has to conform one to another because there's parts of it that will not agree. Uh, it, it just practical things like that, is, it's similar to where you have somebody in a Victorian house with a, with, with a, uh, with a fancy new car, or you have like somebody in a trailer, uh, a trailer park with a, uh, with, with the Lamborghini in the, in the parking lot right next to the, uh, the, the trailer. You know, one's a, hundred, a quarter million dollar car and the, the, the house is worth less than $2,000, you know. Uh, it doesn't look right, if you will, in a sense. 
but it is even more so to the uh, New and Old Testament, the uh, the church versus Israel, and so oftentimes people try to make the church Israel and the Israel the church, and and they're mixing and matching things that don't belong together in a sense. They have their own purposes. Old bottles hold old wine. New bottles hold new wine. Church hold church things. Israel holds Israel things. Uh, and you cannot mash them together like the Catholic Church tried to do, make a spiritual Israel uh, into a new garment. It doesn't work that way. And no man put new wine in old bottles, else the new wine will burst in the bottles, and they shall, and they shall be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. Why do we need to keep these things separate? It's because if you put them together in the wrong way, they're going to perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Both are preserved. So we see here, we need to keep those things separate. We need to understand the purposes for both. You cannot mix and match. Uh, no man was having drunk old wine, straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Now, we think about grape juice. We think about fermented wine. Uh, somebody who gets drunk thinks the old is better, right? He's like, oh, yeah, I want more of that that wine, I'm addicted to it. But you got grape juice, which is healthier for you or whatever, and it has a different purpose. Now, so wine can, especially back in that day, could sanitize uh, water, and it could, uh, it could sanitize wounds and stuff like that. It had a purpose and a usefulness. So to wine, you, uh, uh, new wine, you could drink it without getting drunk. It had a purpose. And, and you mix it, try to mix the two together, they lose their separate purposes. And that's what he's trying to show them here. Yes, they, you should celebrate. You should be excited. You should not try to reject the prayers and the fastings, but you should not try to expect people that are celebrating to be automatically separated in these certain ways, in these rituals. And you should stop worrying about that, murmuring about that, and celebrate with your new brothers in Christ. He says, but these new, but he says, no man, ha for he saith the old, is better. How often times when you have something that is new, you forget to realize that they're just, they may be different, and you complain, oh, we should do everything the old way. Everything old is not necessarily bad, and everything new is not necessarily bad either, but you can't just kind of mix and match. It's just kind of like trying to make uh, the government conform to the laws of Israel. They're not the same thing. Uh, and so we as Christians, when we are ministering, we need to focus on bringing people to Christ and yes, we should focus on having prayers and fastings and, and separation and, and studying the Word of God. Those things are important. But when we're focusing on bringing people to Christ, we should celebrate with them and not worry about every little conformity uh, and every little thing that they're not quite up to par where we would be. Uh, we need to celebrate with them regardless. You, you can't be like the prodigal's brother who says, well, my brother smells like a pig pen. Uh, my brother is all, all, um, you know, drug addicted, skinny, and because he's been being starving and all these things, and he looks horrible. You cannot be complaining about the looks of your brother when he's come back. You need to celebrate with the family. You need to celebrate with the family. And so here in this passage, we need to understand the the importance of celebrating with those people who come to Christ, not worrying about every little thing being in place and proper. Even though those things are important, we need to focus on them coming to Christ and celebrate with them. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the opportunity and the importance of doing things the right way and, and the, also the importance of celebration as well, of realizing the, uh, the old and new garments, realizing that there's a lot of things that uh, occur in a person's life uh, at the moment of salvation, at the moment of coming to Christ, and that we should not allow those outward things, that outward garment, uh, whether new or old, or, or, or bits and pieces, to, to worry us about them at that time in their coming to Christ. Lord, I pray that you'll just help us uh, to receive people. Help us to celebrate with them, uh, to allow the feasting and, and the celebrations to go on and not uh, hamper it with the complaining and the murmuring of, of an imperfect life. Lord, as pray that help us to do what is right, to, to live in the New Testament way and not just try to uh, mix and match what we want, but rather to live the way you've called us to uh, as, uh, as celebrating with those who are saved. And just I pray. Amen.